Um, what's yeah? What's the crux of Putnam's um, his argument? So, so it depends on which one you mean. If you mean the argument where he was trying to prove that brain and vat skepticism is false, that's one argument. If the model theoretic argument is another one, I, I, yeah. I'm happy to talk about either or both of those. Let's try the first first. The the model theoretic uh, warps my mind. It's it's really good, but um, the, the first one, the the uh, proposed uh, self contradiction or self refutation of brain and vat. So the thought was this. Um, I'm going to do this very, very crudely, but I, I hope that it's at least um, intelligible. The thought was this. Ask yourself w what it is that determines uh, what we mean by our words or what contents there are to our thoughts. And if you want to get a sense of what Putnam was worried about, I find it helpful here to think about somebody who's done a portrait. And I want you to imagine the following. I want you to imagine somebody does a portrait. There's a, there's a person, there's a sitter who's sitting in front of her, and she does a portrait, and the portrait is, is pretty good. Uh, but imagine we ask the question, who is that portrait of? And now suppose the answer, you, the answer that you give is, well, well, it's of the sitter. And I ask you, well, what makes it of the sitter? And you say, because it resembles her. It looks like her. Hmm. But now suppose that it turns out that because the portrait artist wasn't so great, that portrait that she painted is actually looks more like some other person whom hmm. she's never seen than it does the actual sitter. Would that make the portrait of the person that it, it more closely resembles? You'd say to me, no, it wouldn't make it of her. After all, the, the portrait artist never saw that person. Yeah. And that suggests the key idea that Putnam had in his externalist phase. The idea was that just as what makes this portrait a portrait of that sitter is at least in part the fact that that person was the person who was sitting for yeah. the painter as she painted. In other words, we have to talk about an object out there in the world. We can't discern what the portrait is, who the portrait is of merely by looking at the portrait itself. We have to know who is out there in the world. So too Putnam thought in 1976 that if you want to ask what are our words, what are they, what do they mean, um, you need to look into the world to see what we use those words to refer to. And the famous example he gave was the example of Twin Earth, w w uh, a world just like, like our world, except the things that are in the, the, the liquid in the water in the streams and in the rivers and that falls from the sky isn't liquid H2O. It's a different liquid with a different chemical su uh, substrate. It's just that it tastes, smells, and looks a lot like uh, our, our H2O, our water. It's X, y, what, X, Y, Z, I think. X, X Y, Z is, yeah. was the technical, the technical chemical composition that he ascribed <laughs> yeah. to it. Um, Putnam said, look, so if you grew up on Twin Earth and you use the word water to refer to that, that uh, liquid out there, you would be referring to uh, that stuff. You would not be referring to our, you would not be referring to water. You would not be referring to H2O. That suggests that if you think that the meaning of a word is what determines the reference of the word, the meaning of the word on tw uh, water on Twin Earth is going to differ from the meaning of the word water on Earth. On Earth, the meaning of the word water is such as to pick out H2O. Um, in fact, it picks out H2O. That's, that's, that's what it means. It will pick out H2O whenever you use that word. Whereas on Twin Earth, that word will pick out XYZ wherever you are. Uh, whenever you use the word, it'll pick out XYZ. And Putnam thought, if that's right, and I'm sorry for a long-winded answer to the question. This is great. Um, Putnam thought, if that's right, now imagine that's true of our words generally. That is, when we use our words, what determines what they mean is at least in part the things out there in the world to which we attach them or try to apply them, or the things out there in the world to which we refer. What that means is that if you were a brain in a vat, you would use the word brain not to refer to brains, but to refer to something else because you've actually never been in contact with the brain. And you would use the word vat, not to, not to refer to vats, because you've never been in contact, presumably, with vats, at least not through your experience. You would mean different things with your, with your words. And what he thought that meant was that, that you couldn't, in fact, formulate for yourself, using the language of brains and vats, that you were a brain in a vat. Yeah. And in a, in a series of articles, he tried to use this to draw the conclusion that if you were a brain in a vat, you couldn't think that you were a brain in a vat. And in fact, it wouldn't so much as be conceivable that you were a brain in a vat. And this was the argument that in the, in the hands of other, other people, many other people thought could be used to refute brain in the vat skepticism. The thought was, look, if you even have the language to refer to brains and vats, that must be because you are in a world where you actually in, in, interact with brains and vats. And if you're in a world where you do in fact interact with brains and vats, then you can't be a brain in a vat, at least not somebody who 
um, who who has always been a brain in a vat. Right. And that was that was the supposed refutation. Very long answer. I apologize, Parker. No, it's so good. It. That was really good, uh, Dr. Goldberg. So, um, I for for those who might be lost, really quick, I, I like to think of like arrows. So, like, um, if if I'm thinking about being a brain in a vat, uh, the the arrow of my reference is going to point to either an actual vat that I've been in contact with, or it's going to point to something in the image. Maybe it's like digital. Or if I'm a brain in a vat, it's pointing somewhere else. So I'm thinking, oh, am I a brain in a vat? Well, if the arrow actually points to real vats, then I'm not. And if the arrow actually points somewhere else, uh, then then maybe I am. But either way, uh, an interesting point uh, for Putnam, there, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to parse it. But an interesting point is for P Putnam argues that it's, it's false either way. If you are a brain in a vat, you're thinking I'm a brain in a vat, but that's false because uh, the, well, because of content externalism, that the reference in the image of that you're being fed into your brain, you're actually not a brain in a vat. You're just a person in reality. And if you're not a brain in a vat, then you're you're not a brain in a vat. So it's false if it's uh, true, and it's false if it's not true. So you, I think you mean it's false if you're a brain in a vat. The, the sentence, I'm yes. a brain in a vat, is false yes. if you're a brain in a vat, and it, that sentence is false if you're not a brain in a vat. Right. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I really liked that. The first time I read through, uh, it's in Reason, Truth, and History for anyone uh, who wants to read that essay? And it's, I'm sure it's everywhere else too. Uh, and you can find a good majority of it in uh, Dr. Goldberg's Brain in a Vat book. Um, but uh, I don't know if this was because I read Nagel myself or if everyone just always goes to Nagel and Nagel ruined this, Nagel ruined it. Um, Nagel says, like, this is compounding our skepticism because if you were a Brain in a Vat, this would show that you just can't even think that thought. And he has some kind of, you know, line that everyone quotes that, like, if that's not skepticism, then I don't know what is. Uh, what, what would you make of Nagel's line there? So, so Nagel's line gave rise to the topic of uh, that I was interested in my dissertation, which was something like this. Um, many people began to worry if the line of argument that, that you and I just went over is, um, is compelling. Many people began to worry that if Putnam's theory of how words get their meaning or how thoughts get their content is true, if content externalism is true, then we could fail to know what it is that we're thinking. Mm -hmm. We could fail to know our own thoughts. And that was, I think, what Nagel was gesturing at when Nagel said, this just compounds skepticism. Because if you think about the Cartesian scenario, whatever you think about Descartes, Descartes had the following, and I would say it's intuitively plausible idea that, look, we might make mistakes about the world out there. We were fallible creatures. We might think something's a tree when, in fact, it's a bush. We might think that something way out in the distance is a person when, in fact, it's a rock. We can make sense of how we can make mistakes about the world out there. But he thought it doesn't so much as make any sense whatsoever to assume that we don't fully know our own minds, what we're thinking. And what the upshot of this this Putnamian series of reflections was, according to Nagel, that if, Na if, if Putnam is really right, it might be that we actually can make mistakes about what we're believing yeah. or what we're thinking. Or at the very least, we could fail to know the contents of our own thoughts. And this is the kind of thing that animated Nagel. And I will say it's the kind of thing that put me into the library, into Butler Library of Columbia University from 1993 to 1995, trying to figure out what, 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 were the upshot, what was the upshot of all of these reflections. Yeah. Well, and that makes a lot of sense knowing uh, Nagel's, you know, the view from nowhere where he said that and then uh, the, the last word and, and how he's trying to put forward like a, a really strong rationalism in the line of Plato and, and Descartes. And um, it makes a lot of sense that he would take that up. Did you, uh, again, this is like summarizing uh, five years of work, but did you did you come down in between uh, Putnam and Nagel or did you side more with Putnam against Nagel? So I actually... Um came to a conclusion that was slightly different from both of them. Mm -hmm. It was a conclusion that was broadly inspired by another philosopher who was on the other side of the country, uh, Tyler Burge at UCLA. The conclusion that I came to was that the worry, the worry that led Nagel to think this only compounds our skepticism was not really a worry. That yeah. you could make sense of how, even if semantic externalism is true, so even if what determines what we mean by our words and uh, the contents of our thought are external features, features about which we may be ignorant, even if that's true, uh, we can still make sense of the idea that we always know the contents of our thoughts, that the contents of our thoughts are not things that are going to be mysterious to us. 